Okay, good morning. Welcome to the Blue Source webinar on classic to contemporary, how the cyclic nature of carbon markets promotes innovation. My name is Lizzie Aldrich and I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Blue Source and I'll be your moderator today. I hope you all have had your coffee and you're ready to buckle up because here we go. We've got a lot to discuss and we've got three experts that we're gonna be doing a Q&A session with um, and I, just tremendously interesting topics. So I'm so glad you could join us. Um, so with our lineup today, we'll have three expert panelists. Um, first, I'm going to give a few slides to give a background and set the stage for the topics. And then we'll have a dialogue with those three industry experts. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. The webinar is being recorded, and if you have a colleague that was unable to attend, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar afterwards. Feel free to share this with them. We'll start with an overview of who our speakers are and a brief introduction to the topics. Then each featured industry expert will have about 20 minutes of Q&A to discuss the topic. And then we'll conclude each of those three Q&A periods with questions from the audience. Altogether, you can budget about an hour and a half for the webinar. Um, so here we go. So the theme of today's webinar is how trends in carbon markets have re reappeared in new forms. And we chose this theme specifically because Blue Source has celebrated its 20th anniversary last month. And during this time for voluntary and compliance carbon market formation, we've learned a lot and we've seen themes throughout carbon markets emerge. We wanted to share a few of those with you today. The first topic that we will discuss um, is biogas and how digesters have transitioned from a commodity and offset markets to a very valuable low carbon fuel standard credit. Then we'll discuss how carbon capture and sequestration was originally used as an offset type and now is contemplated for use for compensation of emissions and how there are differences in the new offset protocols anticipated for carbon capture and sequestration. Finally, we'll talk about soil carbon sequestration through regenerative agriculture. And we'll talk about this in terms of how it was used in the past as an offset technique and how it is being used today through a variety of new standards uh, with traditional standards bodies, as well as uh, with some private companies through updated protocols for quantification of emission reductions. So that's, those are our topics. And before we jump into them, let's talk a little bit about the background of our speakers. For our first speaker, we'll have Patrick Wood. Patrick is the founder of Ag Methane Advisors, which is a niche consulting firm that helps livestock producers reap the benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. For the past 14 years, his primary focus has been on the various environmental commodities, offsets, LCFS credits, RECs, and RENs that are available to dairy biogas producers. Patrick has a background in production, agriculture, and a master's degree in applied ecological economics from the University of Vermont. Our second speaker talking about carbon capture and sequestration will be Kip Coddington. He's a chemical engineer and lawyer and a low carbon technology and climate policy expert with commercial project and academic research leadership experience. He is also on our advisory board and we appreciate that. He's currently the director of the Center for Energy and Regulation and Policy Analysis at the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming. At SER, he is also the co-principal investigator on more than $15 million of projects related to carbon capture and utilization and storage, or CCUS, with funding from the US DOE. An internationally recognized expert on carbon management technology policy and transactions, KIPP co-founded the North American Carbon Capture and Storage Association. Prior to academia, KIPP practiced law with major international law firms he also co-founded a boutique energy and environmental law firm. He's an expert in the US Clean Air Act and low carbon policies. And he lived in London several years where he negotiated the Kyoto Protocol transactions. Kip has his BS in chemical engineering from Purdue and a Juris Doctor from Georgetown University. Jamie McKinnon is our third speaker. 
and he will be talking about regenerative agriculture and soil carbon sequestration. As Vice President of Environmental Solutions, Jamie leads Blue Source's project sourcing and policy work for Canada. Jamie works with proponents of greenhouse gas reduction and renewable fuel and electricity projects across the country to help leverage the diverse range of carbon offset, low carbon fuel standard, and renewable energy certificate markets. He brings a strong track record as a catalyst of significant project investment in renewable natural gas, forest carbon sequestration, waste to energy, programmatic fuel switching, renewable power generation, energy efficiency, and methane capture across the diverse sectors of the economy. It's a lot of different sectors. Pretty amazing, Jamie. He's worked in the carbon market since 2002 at their first inception with the oil and gas industry, consumer packaged goods, and carbon offset development sectors, and has a deep technical, financial policy, and strategic skill set in this area. Before engaging each of these experts in some dialogue, I'm going to go through a few slides to give a brief background of the three topics that we'll be talking about today so that everyone in the audience has an equal playing field as we begin to dive deep into these topics. So I am sharing hopefully successfully my slides um, and here's our, our cover slide. We're going to jump right into it. I promise to take no more than 10 minutes of your time to give you a little background on these topics. So first of all, if you're joining us and you don't know who Blue Source is, Blue Source uh, has a 20 year history in carbon offset origination. Uh, we have developed a variety of, of different markets since then. We operate in both compliance and voluntary carbon markets. And we have a nine year old renewable fuel business where we work in low carbon fuel standard and REN markets. And we're primarily working with D3 gas from wastewater treatment plants, landfills, and manure digesters. We can source offsets for our clients from all around the world. We also source RECs from around the world. And we're also an innovator, investing in some, in some of our greenhouse gas mitigation projects, making markets, and seeing avenues for new greenhouse gas reductions and pursuing them. This is our project portfolio as it relates only to the three types of projects that we're going to discuss today. Carbon capture and sequestration is in light blue. You can see it scattered throughout Alberta as well as the US. Soil carbon is in the darker blue and biogas in the black. I'd like to mention that Blue Source will have soil carbon offsets available in late 2022, early 2023 timeframe. Our speakers today, we've got Patrick Wood, there's a picture of them, Kip Coddington and Jamie McKinnon. I've given you their bios. This is the order in which we'll go, biogas, CCS, and soil sequestration. So first to just briefly talk about biogas, what is it that we're talking about here? Well, back in the time frame of the early 2000s, uh, digesters were really valuable primarily for their offset generation. And offset generation was accomplished through the destruction of biogas. So for large dairies and swine facilities, oftentimes the manure is handled through an anaerobic lagoon, which is just basically a, a pond where all of the manure is pumped. And it just sits there and it um, methanogens, which are um, naturally present in that manure, break down the manure to produce methane. And the methane is off-gassed into the environment. So in the early days of carbon market formation, we realized that we could provide an economic incentive for farmers to capture that methane. And through capture of the methane, they would need to destroy it. And they, in doing so, would convert that methane to a less potent greenhouse gas, CO2. And if you send it through a boiler or a genset, you also get some uh, productive use out of that methane, uh, using it either for heat in a boiler or electricity in a genset. But even just flaring that methane from methane to CO2 creates valuable reductions, since methane has a global warming potential that is about 28 times that of CO2. Um, in the most recent IPCC report. So this was the old days. We would take that biogas and we would destroy it to create offsets. 
And in the early days, offsets were valued at somewhere between six and $8 per metric ton. If you were selling into the California compliance market, which these offsets are eligible for, you could expect somewhere between $12 to $15, $16 US per metric ton, um, which was good, but perhaps not enough to incentivize the widespread development and capital costs associated with these digesters. So enter our new um, 2012 onward timeframe. Um, this is the time when the LCFS in California was developed and um, throughout iterations of the LCFS, LCFS over time, this biogas can actually be utilized for the California low carbon fuel standard and create much more valuable credits. Now at the end of this process for the LCFS value alone, you're looking at right now current price is about $190 per metric ton. Compare that to the maximum of $15 per metric ton that you can get in the California markets. And you can see just how valuable this is and how it's created a real gold rush for the development of these digesters. And I should mention that um, those digesters that are from the manure are more valuable than those from other types of feedstocks like wastewater for a variety of reasons, but primarily because you're avoiding the release of the methane into the atmosphere, which is what would have happened in this baseline scenario. The California Air Resources Board does not consider that wastewater treatment plants have a baseline where the methane would go into the atmosphere, although that is under some conversation right now. Um, I should also mention that there is a difference in this process. Now, the gas goes to the digester rather than getting combusted directly on site. It needs to go through gas conditioning equipment. So it does need to get upgraded to pipeline quality. And then it is either injected through a direct injection point or it is transported via tube trailer to an injection point where it is put into our national natural gas pipeline grid. And in order to get credit for this in the California markets, you pair that gas through a book and claim accounting process with an off taker in California that has a compressed natural gas station. And so that is the key to getting these valuable LCFS credits. They have to go to the transportation market in California. Now I should mention there's more value for this gas through the REN markets, the federal renewable fuel standard is has been in place since 2007 that's the rfs2 and under that program they can earn these credits are valuable for um, refiners all throughout the entire united states who have to comply with the rfs system and so under the rfs system uh, these rin credits hold a, a value not as valuable as the CFS credit, but it can, you can look at about for manure digester projects, approximately $90 per MMBT of gas. So it's very significant. I should mention that farms with 3,500 head and a baseline of an anaerobic lagoon are those that are the most ideal candidates for this program. Wastewater as well as landfill gas can also play in both of these markets, generate both of these credits. However, they earn less credit in the LCFS market, the same amount of credit in the REN market, but less credit in the LCFS market because there is a full life cycle analysis done of the carbon intensity of the gas. So I know that was a lot. We'll dive deeper into it with Patrick in our first discussion. Our second topic will be carbon capture and sequestration. So carbon capture and sequestration, just briefly for folks who are not familiar with it, um, involves the capture of CO2 from stack emissions, the piping of that CO2 to an appropriate injection site, the injection of the CO2 underground, and then um, there are a couple of ways this can be done. I first have carbon capture and sequestration paired with enhanced oil recovery, just simply to express that this can be done to actually through a tertiary uh, recovery push out more oil out of the ground. Injection of the CO2 can actually be used to push out more oil. And in doing so, some of the CO2 injected 
actually binds to the sandstone or the rock where the, the oil and gas reservoir is and permanently remains stored in there. So you're injecting CO2, but you're also getting out another fossil fuel. So this is called CCS paired with EOR. Um, sometimes it's just referred to as EOR. And I bring this graphic up first because during some of the early days of carbon offset crediting for CCS, it was done through a protocol that credited CCS paired with EOR. And this was really the only financially viable way to support CCS because of the, the extreme cost associated with the pipeline interconnection and separation of the CO2 from other flu gases and stack gases. And you're unable to inject it all underground because that would then be considered a hazardous waste. So the costs were quite high and um, carbon offsets helped incentivize this type of activity, which involved this permanent storage of a portion of that CO2 underground. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Blue source actually was active in the early days of CCS and the cost for some of these pipelines was incredibly significant in the double digits of the millions. And these carbon offset revenues helped fund these pipelines. So in the absence of these projects, the stack emissions from some of these particular projects that were natural gas processing plants would have gone into the atmosphere. And so these were additional projects very helpful in the early days of the market. And now we have a new iteration of these protocols that are coming out that I'll discuss shortly. But I did just wanna bring this up because in the early 2000s, 2000 to 2008, Blue Source was actively involved with several of these types of CCS projects. So now in the next iteration of CCS that we're gonna talk with Kip about today, there are protocols that are being developed under various standards and variations of existing protocols that allow for CCS with EOR um, through, for example, the American Carbon Registry that would involve injection of CO2 underground into a reservoir, typically a depleted oil and gas reservoir or deep saline aquifer. There are some discussion of injection in basalt or under the ocean. We'll talk about how feasible those other injection sites are with KIP today. But injection of the CO2 underground into a reservoir, not for the purposes of enhancing additional oil recovery, but simply for the injection underground. As you can imagine, since there's no commodity being produced, this is a very, very expensive proposition. And that's why it has not gained a whole lot of traction and in industry um, support to date. However, there are some new incentives through uh, Q45 that we have that do provide uh, significant financial incentives for this type of sequestration. And we'll discuss those. And those can be additive with carbon offsets to make the entire project activity more viable. Lastly, we're gonna talk with Jamie about carbon sequestration and soil. And so this is something interestingly that was um, in vogue in the 2006, 2007 timeframe with the Chicago Climate Exchange, which was the very first um, voluntary but legally binding um, carbon market in the United States. There was a soil carbon sequestration protocol. Today with Jamie, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened with that protocol and how new iterations of soil carbon sequestration have changed and become more stringent. Um, over the years, we have seen these protocols developed in 2012, VCS created a soil carbon protocol. Today, we're gonna to talk about what is different and why we're hearing so much more about soil carbon sequestration. Just to give you a few ideas of what would actually sequester more carbon in the soil, um, and what types of practices may um, be eligible for this type of project. Um, there are changes to fertilizer application, soil amendments, water management, tillage and residue use, crop planting and harvesting, fossil fuel usage, grazing practices, etc. So there are a variety of different um, practices that farmers would engage in that would be different from their standard business as usual practices for farmers in that area that can help store more carbon in that soil. So we'll dive into that today. So with that, I think I kept it almost to 10 minutes and I'm ready to jump into the Q&A period. Okay. 
So first we're gonna talk with Patrick Wood of Ag Methane Advisors. Um, so Patrick, my first question for you is this, when did the first incentives for anaerobic digesters via carbon revenues pop up in the US? Um, so thanks Lizzie, it's really nice to be here with you and everybody else. Um, so in the late 90s, there were a couple programs that started to pop up. Um, they were very unique and sort of one off. I think that's when, if I recall, around when TerraPass got started and TerraPass has morphed. I think that's also when the Climate Trust um, started creating offsets on behalf of Bonneville Power Administration. But mostly it was in the mid 2000s. So you mentioned the Chicago Climate Exchange before and the Chicago Climate Exchange also had a protocol for livestock offset, uh, livestock offsets from digesters. So it's mostly in that mid 2000 range. Um, and there were a few other programs, some unique ones in Vermont. I'm based in Vermont. Green Mountain Power is a utility that didn't exactly create carbon offsets, but they had a voluntary green power pricing program. So they pay a fixed rate per kilowatt hour. Um, and that got a lot of digesters built here, so. That's super, thanks for that, that background. Um, it's just so interesting now that we're 20 plus years into this to see what changes have occurred. Um, and rightfully so, as these markets mature and certain technologies become more financially viable or not. Um, so what kind of value per metric ton did farmers receive under these early programs? The value farmers can receive can really vary a lot. It depends upon the, the business arrangements um, that they have with the developer or whoever is helping them create the offsets. Usually farmers aren't doing that themselves. But um, you mentioned before the CCX was largely in a price range of six to eight dollars. And so I think many farms were getting uh, paid but probably between two and five dollars uh, per metric ton then. And a lot of it has to do with um, how they want to contract, how long they wanted to contract for, do they want a 10 year fixed rate or, uh, or some other sort of structure. And so there's a, a lot that comes into play, um, but generally probably in that two to $5 per metric ton range. Great, it's a drastic comparison to, to where we are today. Um, and before we hop into kind of the more recent developments, I know I spoke about 3,500 head as being kind of a threshold currently for the LCFS program. There are a lot of extra pieces of infrastructure from the conditioning skid that is necessary to upgrade the gas to pipeline quality, et cetera. Back in the days where we were creating just offsets, what was the minimum threshold for creation of an offset project in the capital cost for investment of the digester? What was the minimum head? So building a digester on a, on a dairy farm or a spine farm in general, it's just, there's a basic economy of scale question. The bigger the farm, the more economical the project is overall. And that translates to creating the offsets or the LCFS credits or whatever environmental commodity you're producing. So in general, um, bigger is more efficient economically. That said, there are smaller projects that um, had unique circumstances. Maybe they had a unique circumstance with a, a particular buyer who made it work. But to answer your question, most farms back then were probably in the certainly a thousand cows or more range um, at, at, a, at a minimum. Um, and one thing that's been sort of interesting about the evolution of the dairy industry is we tend to have more larger farms over the past 15 years. And so that's, we, back in the mid 2000s, there was a, a relatively small number of farms that had say 5,000 cows or more, but there's a lot of dairies expanding a lot. Um, but back then there's more, most of the farms had probably between 1,000 and 5,000 cows back in the, in the mid 2000s. Great, thanks for that. And in terms of the programs at the time and how they incentivize digester development, can you just speak a little bit to what you've seen with regards to the uptick or the acceptance of the digester technology among those farms in the early days due to the offset potential? And then, so basically going from 
no carbon revenue available, only grants perhaps to support digesters up until the late 90s to the change to carbon revenue and how that changed the landscape for digesters. And then in the next portion, if you could tell us how you've seen the change in the uptick of acceptance of digesters due to LCFS credits. Sure. So um, the US EPA has a program called AgStar, which um, promotes digesters on, on livestock farms. And they have a, a database of projects um, going up. Essentially, they try to capture all the projects in the country. And they don't have all of them. Um, sometimes it's not completely up to date, but it's, it, I think it's the best resource out there. So in preparation for this, I looked back at that. And before uh, sort of in approximate numbers, before 2003, there were about 25 ag digesters uh, in the country and a handful of those date all the way back to the late 1970s. Um, but by the end of 2010, there were about 130 five ag digesters in the country. And so that's where some of the initial offset programs uh, helped along with a lot of USDA grants and other grant programs. By the end of 2017 or through 2017, there were about 230 ag digesters in the country. And, um, but over the last couple years, this RNG boom has, um, has really pushed a lot more. And let me bear with me one second. I think as of, um, so the AXAR database showed about another, shows about 330 total now in progress since, so that's about another 100 since 2017. So shows about 25 of those being built in 2020. And it reports projects that are in construction. And I don't know, exactly what their threshold is, but I think they're not reporting projects that are theoretical. They're reporting projects that are serious commitments have been made to start them. They've probably been permitted. Ground has probably been broken. They showed about another 50 being built in 2021. Wow, that's, that's a quick uptick. And uh, we do know how long these projects take. So it could be that there's many more in the pipeline that aren't reflected in the AgStar database. Absolutely. Um, Patrick, I know we talked about the value of the LCFS program. If you, and I'm kind of a little bit going off script here, so don't worry if you don't know this number offhand, but in terms of like for a farmer to think about this value per head, I know in the early days of the offset markets, because I too was developing offsets under these, you know, these big, large uh, manure digesters, we were looking at somewhere between three to $5 per head. Um, from the value of the carbon offset. If you were to tell us now, what is the value per head from the LCFS and REN program? Because again, those credits can get stacked on top of each other. What would be the value per head? And that's head of animal, if you're not familiar about talking about herds of animals. So um, I'm not gonna be able to do that arithmetic per head that quickly, but I can give you some examples that I think will answer your questions from projects uh, we've worked on. And if you're talking the value per head to a farm is different than the project value overall. So um, I'll start by talking about the project value overall. Um, We've looked at and done analysis for dairies that milk about 2,500 cows. They have another three or 400 dry cows, and then they have some young stock. So they have about that 3,500 lactating Holstein equivalent um, total on their farm, all of which are contributing manure to the digester. And when you take the LCFS value and the REN value, and for the work we do, we don't often um, build in the brown gas value, but that's a small component of it. They can be on the range. It, a, a lot depends on how the farm managed their manure in the baseline, how much of that manure was going to a lagoon. Um, but they can generate and like gross revenue can be on the range of four to eight million dollars a year, depending upon different scenarios um, of what you assume for market prices. And, and that's the 
that's the total pie. That's the total pie from the environmental credits from the project. So if you're going to look at value to the farm, uh, you have to really think about how is the farm involved? Who are their partners? And to create these credits, um, it's not just the, the, the producers of the credits, whether that's a digester development company, a farm, they're also partnering with an end user of the credits. The credits aren't created either in the RIN credits or the LCFS credits until the energy is used for transportation on the road. So in rough numbers, those end users maybe get 10 to 20% of the pie. Um, then you're left with sort of 80 to 90% of the pie that gets divvied up between um, the project developer, the farm may get a portion, um, or the farm certainly gets a portion, but going back to your original question, what size the farm gets, it really depends upon how they're involved. The farm may just be leasing space on their farm and providing manure, so there may be a simple lease agreement. The farm may be on the opposite end of the spectrum, may, may be developing the project themselves. They may own and operate it. Some farms want to do that. Some farms just want to focus on producing milk. So certainly if you're putting down the capital, owning and operating the project, you're going to see a much bigger piece of the pie. It's a great, great response. There are a lot of players involved here. And while the farmers certainly do get added benefit, there's also the capital cost associated with the additional pieces and the transportation off taker takes a healthy chunk there of the value. Um, so there is, it's quite interesting. There's quite a competitive market for getting gas into the California markets, right? So um, the, the lower the CI value, this dairy manure gas, it's, it's more valuable. And so the landfill and wastewater gas is getting edged out of the market. And well, like Patrick said too, all farms are not created equal. Those that were kind of the worst actors in the baseline scenario and had the anaerobic lagoon, didn't have their, cow, their cows on dry lot, but we're managing the lagoon in a way that it produced the most amount of methane. Well, they have the most amount of reductions to be made. Um, so they're the ones that end up with the most value in these markets. Um, and that's, that's just the way they've designed it. Uh, but the, the markets are doing what they're intended to do, which is they're stimulating the new creation of these digesters, which is a messy, complicated and uncertain process. So it's, it's pretty cool to watch this whole thing transpire. Um, if we just think about $15 per metric ton in the old days of the offsets as a, as a cap, and now we're looking at $200 per metric ton, more or less, with the RIN and LCFS value, you can think about the fact that that's, that's a significant increase per head um, of, of how much value is there. Um, so you're, you're looking at, at nearly a tenfold increase. Um, so to, to move on a little bit, Patrick, we know that the value is for these digesters right now is primarily through the California system. The federal RFS system does provide some incentive, but probably not enough to get these new digesters under development. So in California, we realize there is this new Senate Bill 1383. It is requiring that a highly potent greenhouse gases like methane be controlled by the year 2024. And it specifically speaks to large animal operations like CAFOs that would be the most eligible for the creation of these digesters. So due to this Senate bill going in in California, um, there is talk and concern of the fact that that would negate the creation of these very valuable avoided methane credits, giving the highly valuable LCFS credits to these farms after the year 2024, after January 1st, 2024. Can you speak to this particular bill and any kind of industry knowledge or insight that you may have on whether or not you think there will be litigation that pushes that date out? Because that's a pretty firm deadline for these folks trying to get these digesters under, develop, under development and getting their ARB approval prior to that date. Sure thing. So let me just clarify a couple of things about Senate Bill 1383. So it was passed and signed into law in 2016. What it says is that not before January 1st, 2024, um, 
CARB must implement regulations to reduce methane emissions from dairies if certain conditions are met. So it's a little bit confusing. First read, you say, oh, they must implement the regulation, but only if certain conditions are met. So the question is, are those conditions going to be met for them to implement this regulation? And SB 1383 is, um, its purpose is to address short-lived climate pollutants of which methane is one. And, there, um, and the law says that um, CARB needs to work to meet a goal of 40% methane reductions in California by 2030. So a lot of the question is, what kind of progress are they making towards that goal? How many digesters are being built? Um, how many alternative manure management practices like using solid separation to divert manure from a lagoon, how many projects like that are being built. Um, and it seems my crystal ball is that I don't think CARB wants to use the stick approach. They certainly have the legal basis to use the stick approach that that law has been passed. They haven't, to my knowledge, started development of this regulation yet that couldn't take effect before 1 1 2024. So we're actually not too far away from that compared to when this was first passed. But it seems like they would prefer to use the carrot. The incentives of the LCFS program are really strong. It's getting a lot of projects built. There are um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Uh, money from that goes to invest in projects, to invest in, to provide capital for infrastructure for RNG pipelines. And so, CARB, um, CARB gave a webinar in May 2020 reporting um, on, um, on their progress and some of these, some of the barriers or some of the conditions that have to be met involve things like um, the, the economics of the sector in general. So the dairy economics are not good. It is really hard to run a dairy uh, alone. And so to impose on dairies a massive cost of building a digest or doing these other things would seem, would be really problematic. So there would undoubtedly be pushback from the dairy industry uh, in California. I would, my expectation is that yes, people would um, legally try to delay the program, um, if not stop it altogether. Another important consideration for CARB is leakage. So under SB 1383, they can't implement regs that would cause dairies to close down in California and shift to other nearby states. That's something that some dairies do anyway because of all the regulations that already exist in California. So those are all the cons those are some of the big considerations CARB has to take into effect before they start developing this regulation. One last thought that's just important to keep in mind is CARB has been very clear that projects that come online and start receiving credits before this regulation takes effect will get 10 years worth of credits. They will get to um, reap the value for the avoided methane emissions for their first 10 year crediting period. So there is a, a lot of incentive for projects to get built and operational before January, 2024. Um, uh, but again, we don't, it's, it's still an if whether that regulation will go into an effect. And it's also a, a, a question of when, um, so. Thank you. That is a sticky, sticky thing, but it's good to know those in place before January 1st, 2024 are grandfathered in. So there is a race against the clock to get those constructed and ARB approval, which takes pretty long. <laughs> so get started if you're working on it. Um, Patrick, I wanna ask you about other states. We know that there are there is a um, clean fuel standard in Oregon. There is legislation that has been attempted in Washington. There are many other states, New York, New Jersey, Minnesota, um, Colorado, South Dakota, Iowa, New Mexico, all of them are considering some form of an LCFS program. So just given this SB 1383 that could take effect in California and limit the biogas markets for transportation fuel in California, 
um, or essentially limit the CI score that these particular farms would receive. What do you think about these other states? Do you think they'll follow suit with California? Do you feel like there might be an opening for more markets for this biogas? Um, any thoughts on that? In general, policymakers want to create incentives for the ag sector to reduce emissions. In general, they want to use the carrot to not the stick. Um, and California's LCFS and EPA's um, renewable fuel standard are great examples of that, that, um, that politicians on both sides of the aisle and in, in, in whatever region they're located get behind, not always, but often. And so um, it seems more likely to me that um, there will be incentives rather than mandates. That said, there are, um, back in early April, a group of several environmental groups petitioned US EPA to regulate methane emissions from dairies. And I don't think US EPA has picked that up yet or is moving forward with it, but there are people who are trying to, um, trying to make the case legally that US EPA should do it and has to do it. Um, so, I think that would be a long process. I'm not aware of any states besides California that have even have the legislation or have even talked about the legislation, um, let alone implemented a regulation. In many ways, California leads on environmental policy of all kinds. Um, so we may we may see others lead California in terms of methane reductions. Certainly many people absolutely understand the significance of methane um, and that reducing methane now in the short term is crucially important. And that's dairy methane, livestock methane, as well as methane from oil and gas leak, um, leaks and things like that. But it seems much more like incentives will um, be the method to create the reductions from the ag, ag sector. Thanks, Patrick. Well, we know farmers like working with incentives instead of sticks, that's for sure. So, well, thank you so much. I do wanna just conclude the biogas section with a quick question for Jamie McKinnon, who is our blue source uh, expert in RNG markets in Canada, because Jamie, there has been a little conversation about um, taking biogas from Canada to go into U.S. markets, as well as vice versa, biogas from U.S. going into Canada. We know that BC has its own LCFS program. We know there's a clean fuel uh, program that is under development at the federal level. Can you just tell us a little bit about the status? The pipeline networks are interconnected. So will the markets be interconnected for the environmental attributes as well? Yeah, sure, Lizzie. So the uh, there has been renewable natural gas that has gone from Canada uh, into the U.S. Uh, for the the RFS2 market. There has very recently now been U.S. RNG that has gone into British Columbia for voluntary programs. Um, the British Columbia Low Carbon Fuel Standard uh, only very recently has put a pause on renewable natural gas. Uh, because of a consideration of a sort of a renewable portfolio standard for their gas distributors. So that appears to be a possibility that is not entirely clear today. Um, however, the clean fuel standard, uh, which is uh, federal regulation, uh, is in its draft form. It is very likely to be approved in fall of this year. And as soon as it is, that will enable uh, renewable natural gas projects to get credit under the federal clean fuel standard, which is modeled off of a, an LCFS. And that will, uh, US projects, US RNG, as well as other clean fuels will be eligible uh, and, uh, and will be able to service that demand. Uh, and likewise, uh, Canadian RNG uh, can continue to service uh, California LCFS and, and perhaps other emerging LCFS as well as the REN market. So, so yes, as far as price formation in that is very difficult to tell we're very early on in that CFS market. So if you're wondering about price, join the club. Jamie, thank you so much. It's really interesting. You know, the whole premise of offset markets in general is that a reduction 
from another place should get applied to a different market because it has the same global warming reduction and benefit to our earth. And I think that the combination of these Canadian and US RNG markets is, is kind of an example of that. If it's economical to produce biogas in Canada and we can use that in a US market, then fantastic. Let's make sure there's no double counting of emission reductions. But um, as we open these markets up, that allows for cost of compliance to, to be reduced. So great, we're gonna to switch to CCS now, that's carbon capture and sequestration. And we're gonna turn to Kip. And so Kip, thanks so much for joining us. My first question for you is this, what formations are ripe for CCS? You know, 10 years ago, there was a lot of dialogue about injection of CCS in basalt and formation of a solid, you know, in that basalt formation or injection in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, injection under the ocean. And I always wonder what happens if there's an upwelling event, if we do that. But uh, tell us right now, where, where are the places that are most ripe for injection? Where is it occurring? And um, are, are these other formations, have they kind of been ruled out because we're hearing more and more about deep saline aquifers as the primary location where CO2 would get stored permanently without an EOR component? Absolutely. So Lizzie, thank you for your question. Actually, I wanted to begin by congratulating Blue Source on its 20th year anniversary. I also wanted to commend Bill Townsend, who I think might be on the program. Uh, Bill Townsend was one of the founding members of the North American Carbon Capture and Storage Association nearly 15 years ago now. Blue Source was a founding member of that trade association. Um, and so Blue Source has been um, in these carbon capture storage markets from the very beginning. So, so it's a privilege to be here. To answer your question about formations, all those formations are um, undergoing active research. And number two, nothing has been ruled out. And for that, so uh, back in December of 2010, when the US Environmental Protection Agency finalized the so-called rules that govern the injection of CO2 into the subsurface, and those are under class six of the underground injection control program, EPA actually explicitly said they were not ruling out any geologic formation type. However, they also made clear that all storage formations had to meet a rigorous set of technical based requirements and for formation types that might be more shallow. So basalts, for example, are certainly typically are more shallow than these deep saline formations that are the focus of attention now. If you wanted to inject into a basalt, um, you would typically have to acquire a, um, an exemption from the waiver depth requirement. And, and I apologize if I'm, if I'm getting too technical here, but generally the way the class six rules work, you can only inject under the lowest underground source of drinking water. You're eligible to get a exemption from that, but you have to jump through additional, additional hurdles. Um, so, so as a practical matter, commercially, my sense and opinion is, is we are continuing to see a lot of emphasis on CO2 enhanced soil recovery, more emphasis on saline reservoirs, uh, in part because of the class six program and in part because those have been studied for so long. Those other formation types remain eligible. Um, it would just, be the, the burden of trying to get them through the regulatory process. So, and in terms of offshore, I will say you, you, you had mentioned offshore, there's been a, a, a lot of interesting work going on offshore, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of the, of the Southeast United States. Some of that work, much of that work has been led by the University of Texas Bureau of Economic Geology. So I think for, for projects in the Gulf Coast of the United States, for example, um, I think offshore Gulf of Mexico is, is really, really interesting. Thank you for that. A lot of good information there. I didn't realize that the EPA, the well classification was so um, important in, in where we are injecting, but it makes sense that it would be. 
I'm curious about your thoughts on technological hurdles that CCS has overcome over the last 10 to 15 years to make it more economically viable. We're hearing a lot more about CCS. We, as Blue Source, are getting a lot of requests from buyers that want um, CCS credits that are not associated with more um, oil recovery, but, but just injected underground. We realized that 45Q has provided an economic incentive of $50 per metric ton of, of CO2 stored. But have there been advancements in the technology over the last 10, 15, 10 to 15 years that make it more economically viable? And do you foresee many more projects um, in the next decade undergoing construction? Absolutely. So yes, there have been. So, so carbon capture and storage consist of three components, the capture piece, the transportation piece, and the storage piece. I'll just quickly take out the transportation piece because CO2 pipelines have existed for, for decades. Um, and I'm certain there probably are researchers out there looking for more efficient ways to, to transport CO2, but I consider the transport piece to be done. Um, there's been a huge amount of technological advancements on the capture piece by project type in terms of trying to reduce those costs. Um, and again, we can thank the US Department of Energy and Congress for advancing um, a, a huge amount of research on the capture piece and bringing those costs down. So uh, most of the economic models, for example, now will consider an amine-based capture technology as, as commercial. There's numerous other uh, technologies that are, are, in that, are in that realm. Um, folks are looking at membrane capture technologies. Um, folks are looking at, um, and indeed they aren't looking at it, they're, they're building them uh, like direct air capture facilities um, are under commercial development. On the capture side, there have been tremendous technological advancements in terms of the technology itself and reducing the cost. Um, again, the pipeline piece, I think, was, was kind of one and done. Um, and then on the storage piece, it depends upon, obviously, there's a huge amount of geologic assessment that has to go into proving up a particular storage formation. Um, but uh, much of the science in order to do that is, is known. It just has to be implemented. Of course, all that science, like all science, is always undergoing improvement. Um, but I would say for e EOR and sailing formations, there's a huge amount of confidence as to how those storage mechanisms work. And, and it's anticipated and it's understood that those costs are coming down, coming down as well. So, so yes, I think we're seeing today the uh, fruits of the research investments that have been made uh, on the capture piece and the storage piece and, and reducing costs and coming up with a greater wealth and spectrum of potential technologies that can be used. Thanks, Kip. That's, that is interesting. And I have a question for you a little out of your particular area of expertise with CCS, but since you brought up direct air capture, this is an area that has just gotten a huge amount of interest uh, as of late, um, especially among tech companies that are interested in removals, et cetera. Uh, we know direct air capture can cost between $200 and $600 per metric ton. Uh, I have a question for you about it. I, my understanding is that they do store that CO2 in a solid state through a filter, but am I incorrect in that maybe through direct air capture, there would also be piping of the CO2 and injection at an appropriate underground reservoir? Or is the amount of CO2 being captured by these dock facilities not of the quantity that would um, necessitate a pipeline? So that's interesting. So I would not deduct your question, that, and that is a great question. I might refer that question to the developers of the technology like Carbon Engineering and companies like Oxy Low Carbon Ventures who, who are trying to advance them. So um, I don't actually, I don't actually know the precise form in which the, the CO2 would, would emerge on the other side of that machine. I guess I always, my assumption I thought was that was gonna be injected for enhanced oil recovery. And I thought that was the plan in the Permian Basin. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the capacity of those machines and tying them into a potential future CO2 pipeline network, I think all those, all those economics would have to separately be, would have to separately be 
sorted. But certainly, yes, I think as overshoot in the atmosphere, as a term is understood by the climate modelers under the Paris Agreement, is now anticipated to occur. Um, that it's not sufficient to turn off the spigot. It's not sufficient now to just reduce anthropogenic emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere. We actually now have to be taking it out. Um, so these nets and carbon dioxide removal technologies and, and DAC, I think those are only going to grow in importance and commercial applicability as these climate restrictions continue to get more stringent in the years and decades ahead. Thanks, Kip. Yeah, maybe a, a topic for a future webinar, given all the interest in it. And Absolutely. it's important as those removals, I think, are also avoiding emissions from stack emissions. And so avoiding the, the off-gassing of that into the atmosphere and, and injecting it into a permanent storage site underground. And with that, I want to ask you about um, the poor space um, legislation back in the uh, 2008 timeframe, Wyoming was really ahead of the curve. They had five pieces of legislation dictating poor space ownership. And for those people on the line, pores are those vacuous spaces within the sandstone where the CO2 ultimately resides once it's injected. And so in order to establish a legislative um, framework around CCS, there needs to be some kind of um, ownership structure for that pore space, which is different than the mineral rights or the surface rights, because what we're talking about is a vacuous space underground. And so we know that Wyoming was really out ahead of the curve. Um, what, what are we seeing now in terms of other states and their adoption of legislation to help incentivize CCS in terms of providing clarity on pore space ownership and how important is it that those pieces of legislation be synchronized across state borders since we know these uh, geologic reservoirs certainly don't um, stick to state boundaries? Again, that's a very savvy question. Um, so, and I wanna make clear here, uh, even though I'm a lawyer, I'm a non-practicing lawyer, so I don't want anybody listening to think I'm giving legal advice. So, um, but yeah, so, and again, given the historic perspective of this webinar, I can put that question in, in historic context. So about 10 or 15 years ago, actually it was 15 years ago, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission in the United States, which is a coalition, an interstate compact of, of oil and gas producing states, adopted model legislation and regulations, issued model regulations uh, for carbon capture and storage. Those model rules or laws in some form or fashion were then thereafter adopted in one or more states. They were adopted in Wyoming, they were adopted in North Dakota, they were adopted elsewhere. And generally those, those model rules said that it would be helpful, it would reduce commercial risk if ownership of the poor space, which as you said is, the, is those tiny little void uh, deep in the rock in which the, the CO2 was permanently stored, if that was defined and you know understood as a matter of realty law, if you will. Um, so 10 or 15 years ago, many states, states like Wyoming, not many states, but, but some states passed those laws. Um, I, I think we'll see more of those come on. I will say though, I think out of you know the potential um, you know commercial issues related to the CCS projects, I don't consider defining the poor space to be a, a deal a deal breaker. Obviously it's it's helpful, um, but there is what's known as, as the default American rule. And the default American rule is that if you, whoever owns the surface most likely owns the poor space as well in the absence of a separate reservation of rights. Um, I remember when I was practicing law and private practice at a big law firm in DC a long time ago, um, we did what was deemed to be the, the largest real estate transaction since the Louisiana Purchase. And what we did was run around the country and acquired poor space rights. And all that was done in, in many jurisdictions in which um, there were no poor space statutes. We basically just went to the courthouse and said, filed, filed the deed and said, we are, as part of this transaction, we are reserving poor space rights you know, whether those would ever be subject to, to litigation or not, I don't know, but, um, 
But yes, I think as PCS continues to grow in commercial importance, we'll continue to see more states adopt poor space laws. But even in those that don't, I'm not certain it's a I'm not certain it's a deal breaker. That's that's really helpful, Kit. Thanks. You know, I I'm curious too about liability. We've seen through injection of natural gas and storage. In, in Colorado and other places um, inducing small earthquakes because of the pressurized underground um, it, that field that is created. And I'm curious within the CO2 realm, if we have moved along in the liability question to create something maybe backed by the federal government like the Price Anderson Act for the nuclear industry where each CCS operator pays a small fee that goes into a shared insurance pool. Um, where are we with regards to making the insurance provisions workable for those CCS operators? So when we're, and let me make sure when we're talking about liability, what, what we mean, uh, because it's really important. And actually the, the term I use is long-term stewardship. So generally these projects are gonna last for a long time. They're going to be operating for 60 years and under the regulations they're going to enter what's known as, as a post-injection site care period so that may take you out 80 years and then at the end at the end of that post-injection site care period there's the issuance typically of a of some regulatory document that indicates this this the site is done um that the the plume that was down there is has stayed there everything is safe and so then the question is, what happens after that post-injection site care? Is, the, is there the need for an insurance project or, or governmental role? Um, that issue, again, was debated in D.C. 15 or 20 years ago. There is no federal statutory solution on that. Um, uh, uh, Zurich, I think, I think was the company, um, you know, issued policies for the ADM wells that are still operating in the state of Illinois. I, I don't know how those policies work. That's an interesting benchmark. There are a couple states, North Dakota is one, that have adopted statutes that effectively say uh, at the end of the post-injection site care period, the state of North Dakota, subject to some limitations and restrictions that would have to be interpreted by lawyers, um, will take responsibility for the, for the site. Um, other states have not done that. Um, so I don't know. I, I think, you know, it's hard for me as a risk, as a risk averse lawyer, I can see risk in, in everything, including you know, using my pencil sharpener. Uh, but, but clearly, as, the, as these projects are continuing to advance, um, that piece of it actually seems like it's being managed either, either by companies on balance sheet or uh, or, or through other or through other approaches. I guess to me that is one of the potential loose ends if, if people wanted to worry about things. Uh, but I, I would expect that issue, to the extent it is an issue anymore, to also be resolved either by insurance markets, other commercial players, you know, companies with huge balance sheets, and or you know additional statutes. Thanks. It's great to see Zurich stepped up and, and was able to, to do that and work that project. Um, my last question for you really has to do with the economics of these projects. So I'm curious, this is kind of a multi-pronged question, but with 45Q, um, which gives us $50 per metric ton for CO2 that's stored permanently, and um, a carbon offset value of X, right? These, these credits are no, not eligible in um, compliance markets at this point. I believe they were utilized in Alberta for the Alberta market. We can check in with Jamie on that. But within the US and the California market, they're not, they're not eligible. Reggie doesn't have it as an eligible offset. Um, I'm curious what you think the gap is there. What would the carbon offset value need to be in either a voluntary or a compliance market to make these projects take the leap from kind of demonstration phase to fully commercialized with many sites across the country. And in that response, if you could just tell us how many commercialized CCS, strictly CCS sites do we have um, that CCS with no ERR in the US right now? 
so the economic question that is difficult, obviously that is perhaps the the ultimate question. So uh, I think that the the technological aspects of this are are there in in pieces. What has been difficult to do to date are, are stitch these integrated projects together largely because of business models or lack of business models or or economics. So the role of economics here is critically important. And I know that's stating the obvious. So there probably is no default answer. Um, I, I can't tell you um, what that number is. What I do know is that 45Q you know, you know, was broadened in 2018, number one. That in conjunction with potential use of credits under the low carbon fuel standard in, in California, and I realize that's that's focused on transportation fuels only, that's, you know, certainly 45Q alone anecdotally, at least what I see just from reading the press releases, is that those amendments in 2018, that $50 number for saline, seems to be driving a lot of commercial interest. And with, for some project types and some capture technology types with capture cost hovering around $40 a ton, $50 a ton, you know, some of those projects are probably starting now to get in the money. Also, we see almost every day a new bill introduced in Congress that potentially would further expand and enhance Section 45Q. Uh, there are bills out there that would make it direct pay as opposed to a credit. There are, are, are bills that would um, extend the construction, the commence construction window. There are bills that would increase the credit value. So um, we certainly seem to be in a federal policy environment where there is tremendous policymaker appetite for um, for 45Q type type approaches. So uh, so I, I guess the answer to your question is it's a project by project assessment, um, but certainly the existing incentive at $50 a ton for a sailing project seems to be driving. A, a fair amount of commercial interest. Um, you also then ask about storage sites. So the Department of Energy um, you know, has, has spent a long time, and again, sitting here at the University of Wyoming, we're, we're a benefactor of the US Department of Energy and that's, and that's taxpayers. Uh, the US Department of Energy under its carbon safe program has been trying to um, build out large scale integrated storage projects around uh, well characterized storage sites. Um, and at the moment, there, there are five of those projects that are currently in phase three. A shout out to Wyoming. We have one up in Gillette and actually the image behind me is the, uh, the test well that, that, that we drilled last year by, by Dry Fork Station. So at the moment, you know, the, the federal government is trying to advance five, five sites. Those won't be the only, only five sites though. Um, geologic maps, the U.S. Geologic Survey, the Department of Energy, atlases of storage sites, storage, storage, potential storage reservoirs have been have been public and they're available. And so, in theory, uh, with sufficient research dollars, a sufficient geologist, and a and a drilling rig, you could drill a test well, you know, someplace and prove up that that storage site. So. Um, this this activity on the sailing storage side is going to to build out around um, where a lot of these reservoirs have a lot of that work has been done, um, but that's not going to stop someone else at another facility from going out and drilling their own test well and determining that the reservoir nearby is also suitable and meets class six standards. So I don't really think there are limits in that way. That's great. So it sounds like about five governmentally supported deep saline injection sites currently. And now we need to make the leap to the private sector to be commercially developing these. And maybe there will always be some governmental support or role too in them. But I think it would be interesting in the next few years as the price of carbon increases to see can we get there with private sector. Um, without governmental support for each of the sites. And right. I just wanna make a brief comment because you made a great uh, connection to the LCFS market. And it's my understanding that the um, C 
CCS sites would be primarily from ethanol producers that are injecting CO2 that would have otherwise gone into the atmosphere from their stack emissions at that location to create um, an ultra low CI ethanol product uh, that would go into the California markets. Am I correct that that's the, that is the connection to the LCFS market for CCS? Uh, again, we don't. I don't think there's any ethanol production facilities in in Wyoming. We we have a lot of cattle out here. I don't think we have ethanol plants, and and if we do, I apologize. But yes, that is my. I don't have direct experience with with ethanol facilities in this context, but from reading the trade press, that is my understanding. I believe there's a a, a, a non-trivial number of of ethanol plants that are looking at this this being carbon capture and storage in conjunction with. Uh, the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, which uh, if we, I don't think we said this obviously, but CCS does qualify under that program as of January 2019, I believe. Kip, thank you so much. Such thank a really you. deep topic and you explained it in such a comprehensible way. So thank you. Um, Pardon the pun. So you just, you just said deep topic. It's about a mile deep. Hey, that was a good so pun. <laughs> There's my coffee kicking in. Uh, Jamie, <laughs> thanks for being so patient. And we'll try to really be efficient with our time so we can save time for, for our audience. But um, some questions for you about our soil and where, where we were with the creation of soil sequestration standards in the past prior to 2019. And now where we are, because I think that some audience members may not know that there's actually a long history in carbon offset uh, creation from soil sequestration through CCX, the Chicago Climate Exchange, AgCert, VCS, and the Alberta program, all prior to these new CAR and VCS protocols that are, um, are now eligible and as of 2019, the new iterations. So Jamie, can you give us just a little background on where we were and uh, how we've gotten to the new new landscape? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Lizzie. So, you know, I think the the buzzword that, that everybody is, is using and adopting is regenerative agriculture. Uh, and that can mean a lot of things. Uh, and in general, you have uh, practice changes like cover cropping and going to low no-till, reducing fuel usage, uh, these types of things as, as practice changes. And then you have other activities related to soil amendments, things that fix more carbon and nitrogen in the soils, uh, which, uh, which has more of a sequestration component. So there's a sequestration and a reduction component to most of these projects. Now, uh, we, as you mentioned, we had CCX back in sort of 2003 to 2010. Uh, they did have a soil uh, protocol uh, that enabled a lot of the, the type of practice changes, uh, principally. And, uh, and I think uh, what we're, you know, should be credited in, in many ways of, of being pioneers and getting this, getting this moving. Uh, now, they did suffer from some, some difficulties. They had a, because it's sequestration, you have a permanence issue in any sequestration project. And they had a four-year requirement after which you had no obligations. And, and I think that really um, raised some eyebrows in terms of uh, the assurance around permanence. But most importantly in the CCX uh, was, there, there, it wasn't a particularly transparent protocol. It was available to members, uh, at least initially, and, and certainly the broader public, uh, it, it did not receive that scrutiny and, uh, and, and public buy-in. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, I think was the subject of a lot of, of criticism about its integrity, and and that's a very important lesson I think for for today. Uh, I think the other historical example I would point to that that really was a success in terms of scaling um, soil carbon type projects uh, was the Alberta Conservation Cropping Protocol and one that preceded it. It generated about 16 million tons of emissions reductions. Uh, up until I believe it was about 2016. And uh, it was the largest offset category in Alberta uh, uh, up until uh, that point when wind surpassed it. And it used some interesting dynamics. It set a sector uh, performance standard baseline based on the adoption rates of you know, tillage and other, other practices such that the more these were adopted, uh, the uh, more restrictive the baseline got. 
And I think the really interesting aspect to this program is it was pulled because it's no longer considered going to, to low no till is no longer considered additional in Alberta. And it's received some criticism to that effect, but uh, I think it's it's not merited because it's the offset protocol itself that really did incentivize uh, a lot of further adoption of these practices and it 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 ran its course, which is what they should do. Uh, and so I think uh, we can credit that early adopter in, in Alberta for a lot of really good action on soil carbon and, and you know, regenerative ag practices. Um, so uh, where we are today, well, uh, I think we have uh, learned a lot of those lessons and you see, uh, you see protocols like the uh, Climate Action Reserve um, uh, Soil Enhancement Protocol and the uh, VERA Improved Agricultural Management Protocol taking those lessons. You know, in the case of VERA, uh, they use that, that adoption rate uh, mechanism as a, uh, for, for additionality determination. They also borrow from Alberta's approach in uh, how they treat permanence in large contributions to a buffer pool that are quantified on the basis of known risks of reversals, uh, which is a mechanism that Barry uses. Um, and so I think that the, uh, there's been a, a renaissance of, of regenerative ag on the basis of a better understanding of the, the science, certainly the availability of data. Uh, and aggregators of data and, that are able to, to access that uh, and, and, and carbon markets uh, just affording um, those, uh, you know, the type of value that we need to see to, to further these projects. Jamie, thank you. That was a great kind of background. And I, I do just want to mention, because you brought up Alberta's program, it is one of the most interesting ones in that they did have a sliding scale of additionality based on the adoption rates of certain agricultural practices that would enhance soil sequestration in the region. And if a farmer was in a particular region with low adoption rates, that would afford the farmer a higher um, percentage of carbon credits. Um, from that activity. And we've never really seen this. It's always a binary. Yes, you qualify or no, you don't. But this was really an innovative approach that Alberta took to say, hey, we realize that there is some gray area in the middle and we're going to actually apply this sliding scale of additionality. So I just bring that up in terms of thinking about future offset protocols and crediting of activities that may have low adoption rates not not adoption rates that would be indicative of kind of a commonplace activity in the market and how to get there. And that's so great that they they iterated until finally they didn't need that protocol anymore. And it naturally went out of existence because of that. So we're really seeing, Jamie, you've made some great comments about the new CAR and, ACE and, um, and VCS protocols related to soil sequestration, but we're also seeing individual companies that may be private companies or maybe they are um, new in the carbon space that are both project developers and creating their own standard. And some of those are Nori, Bear, uh, Land Lakes has created a true Terra program. There's the B carbon standard, there's Terra Mera. This is this whole new landscape of different types of uh, standards that, that the voluntary carbon market is trying to make sense of. We are used to ACR, CAR, and VCS in the U.S. Those are the three main ones. Now, how do buyers make sense of this? And is there an inherent conflict of interest when there may be a company that is both the author of a protocol and the project developer under the protocol that they are authoring? Yeah, I think the quick answer to your question is, is, is yes, there is. Uh, I can I can appreciate uh, what they're trying to do. Uh, at the end of the day, the the CAR and the Vera protocols uh, use very well accepted uh, standards for ensuring additionality, uh, permanence, um, you know, verifiability, and 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 all of these things. But they can be difficult uh, to um, to use in terms of enabling projects uh, because you know CAR would be a good example. Permanence is very restrictive in terms of requiring long-term commitments, and and if not, uh, you know, significant discounting of, of offsets. 
the VCS protocol is quite restrictive on additionality and a 20% adoption rate is the sort of threshold. So I think what a lot of these entities like Nori, True Carbon, Bayer are, are doing is uh, those, those market accepted standards aren't fitting well into their commercial um, prospects. And so they are trying to uh, or, or, or really using their own standards to fit into the way their commercial um, uh, you know, operations are, um, are, are going to be viable. And I think that, uh, I think I can understand uh, that because at the end of the day, they all want to see greater adoption and uh, of regenerative ag practices, but it comes at a very significant risk that, uh, that the permanence, uh, the additionality the verifiability of these reductions is going to be called into question, as it was in CCX, as it has been in the past, uh, and continues to be for other project categories. And so I, I certainly feel that we do need to be relying on the standards that are from independent third party um, uh, organizations such as ACR, CAR, uh, Vera, and working with those and designing programs that uh, that has the integrity of the emissions reductions at, at, the, at the core. And so I, I, I hope that these other, other I wouldn't call them standards. They don't, they haven't, none of them have actually issued actual protocols that are transparent about what they're, how they're calculating these things. And, uh, and that's a real danger. I, 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 I hope and believe though, uh, that the market will move towards um, the, you know, the, the independent standards that we're all used to and that, uh, that support uh, high quality emission reductions. Definitely some lessons from the past that we could possibly use now. Um, with regards to the ex ante crediting, I wanna dive into that for a minute because some of these standards allow for crediting of practices uh, that were taken 10 years before the farmer was even aware of these carbon offset um, opportunities. And so we certainly don't want to penalize good actors in the market, but at the same time, we want to make sure we're crediting activities that are additional to a business as usual situation that are making real carbon reductions to solve our climate crisis. Can you speak a little bit to how the VCS and CAR protocols address ex ante crediting and how perhaps without naming names, some of the other alternative um, protocols address it? Sure. So, I mean, VCS, just using it as an example, has a, a five-year period in which you're able to, to look back on um, sequestration. Now, the, there's an operational challenge with that. Uh, there's a very significant requirement around data uh, in order to even start a project uh, using these standards. And so there's, there's a limited capacity to look back and credit reductions in the past. Uh, using these these standards now, we, we simply don't know what the standards are for uh, true carbon uh, Bayer carbon initiatives. So it's very hard to say uh, to what ex to what you know what rigor of data is required. Uh, and so what we do know that you know Nori is doing uh, ex ante crediting. Uh, I, I think it's a way that they can uh, show a, a significant value uh, to the grower that 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 is compelling. I don't think that it is something that can be scaled and that uh, the buyers of, of carbon offsets will at any scale find, um, uh, you know, f find to be permanent uh, reductions uh, unless they, uh, they do publish those standards and they're very, they, they, they become transparent about exactly how they're doing that. Uh, you know, I think that one interesting example, these have been very high profile announcements, uh, but Nori has produced just over 40,000, um, you know, offset credits to date. Uh, they are struggling to, uh, I think, create a scalable solution on that basis. Thanks, Jamie. It's definitely a buyer beware situation where the buyer needs to ask if there is a standard that's getting used or a protocol that is not publicly available how is permanence, additionality, verifiability, ex ante crediting treated under that particular um, quantification? And the, the typical buyer may not know to ask those questions. So it is a bit of an asymmetry of information too for, for the buyers here. 
In terms of the market, and this will be my last question, so I can get a few questions from the audience, but I'm just curious in terms of you know, price per ton, we've seen about 15 to $20 per ton for soil carbon offsets out in the market. And um, I'm just going forward, do you anticipate, Jamie, that these will be integrated into compliance markets beyond just Alberta, because we know it was adopted there. Um, and is this price sufficient to incentivize widespread development of this? And will there be new soil sampling techniques that can help reduce verification cost and improve reliability and perhaps embolden um, farmers to take some of their own actions to help with ver verifying or doing sampling to um, assure buyers of the carbon they're getting? So I, I think the, the $15, $20 uh, pricing has, has been, you know, there's a very thin, uh, there's a very thin references uh, they relate to a few transactions, but I, I think those prices are are really supply side driven because I don't believe you can get widespread adoption of regenerative practices at carbon prices below that. Uh, you do need that price, uh, probably minimum that pricing, and so I think that the the sheer nature of this problem, the the massive co benefits that it entails in terms of soil health, I think it the the market will support. 15, 20, 25, and even higher carbon pricing in the future to, to get this done. Uh, we do see uh, the federal government in Canada prioritizing a soil enrichment protocol. I think the prospects in the US uh, relate more to the adoption of carbon pricing regimes, which doesn't appear to, you know, particularly um, probable. But where there is a, 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 a really interesting opportunity is as it relates to biofuels. Uh, and crops for biofuels and therefore uh, getting regulators like California be comfortable with these practices and uh, the ability of regenerative ag practices to lower the carbon intensity of biofuels that go to California. And so probably another way to to monetize at very high carbon, high carbon prices, regenerative ag practices. Uh, and, and so I think it's that combination of, of, of pricing that, that goes after this really premium natural climate solution uh, opportunity uh, and and the reduction of costs through soil tests, for example, where there is a lot of research and development going into reducing the costs of uh, of soil testing, which which is going to support uh, a lot of well the economics of projects, but but particularly support a, a much greater opportunity related to nitrogen fixation in soils, which currently is is not really being uh, monetized because of the high price, the high cost of, of testing. So. Thanks, Jamie. The nitrogen fixation is a whole nother piece of the uh, soil protocols in, um, that, that should be considered. And I am, I know we're going to take a few questions from the audience, but I just loved the link to the LCFS program again, you know, thinking through the life cycle analysis of the carbon emissions associated with creation of, say, ethanol, for example, if regenerative ag practices are used on the crops to grow the ethanol, say it's corn based ethanol, then you're going to have a lower life cycle emissions associated with that fuel, which will earn it credit in the California market. And we know how valuable that market is right now. So just a really neat um, connection, and I know active dialogue is going on right now to advocate for those types of um, life cycle review to apply that to the fuel. So if you do have a question, pop it in the Q&A. Uh, we can go a few minutes over. For the people that do need to drop, I just want to mention, don't miss our future webinars or newsletters. These markets are moving fast. There is a lot going on. You can sign up at bluesource.com at the bottom of our page, and we have a quarterly newsletter and a quarterly webinar. We promise not to bother you any more than that. Um, so with that, let's look at the questions that we have in the Q&A piece. Um, let's see here. All right. How do you go about getting a grazing program quantified from a carbon perspective? How large of a site is necessary? And so... Um, grazing practices that would perhaps result in less uh, ground compaction and in carbon crediting for that. Jamie, can you take that one? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big topic. So I'd suggest reach out and, and we can dig into it. But uh, the VERA Improved Agricultural Management Protocol would be one that enables that uh, rotational grazing, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, um, 
multi-species grazing and recognizes the reductions from this. Uh, you do need scale for these projects, undoubtedly. And it also really matters what type of soil and soil classification uh, you have. And so uh, I think you're, you're looking at the many, many thousands of acres as sort of uh, your minimum thresholds, undoubtedly. But then it, it very much uh, varies on, you know, according to those, those different factors. Jamie, thanks. One more question for you. Is there a way to aggregate land for these soil protocols? Does it need to be all contiguous or can it be various plots of land? No, absolutely. And we envisage uh, the vast majority of regenerative ag offset projects to be aggregated projects. There will be, you know, very large scale landowners that might be, you know, one off projects, but uh, the, uh, the major protocols do allow for that. Uh, there are cost efficiencies uh, related to aggregations. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think, uh, yes, they do allow for that. And, and, um, and we should see uh, the majority of projects using that mechanism in order to come to market. Now, you're still going to have a minimum acreage uh, in order to, to, to join an aggregation. And it's likely to be in that thousand acre range. Um, so that's, that's still a consideration. The scale is, is always a, an important consideration in this. Thanks, Jamie. Question for Kip, and I think this will be our last one so we don't go too long over, but um, it's a question again about the liability of sequestered CO2. And I know, Kip, you mentioned that Zurich was a company that had um, insured two different sites in, um, in the US for CCS. Do you know of any others? Uh, first off, I want to have a shout out to Mike Moore. Mike Moore, um, along with Bill Townsend, taught me this, all this stuff 20 years ago. So Mike, good to see you. So what I know is that there's a, there are insurance companies that will look at these risks now. So once a month or so, I'll call an insurance broker and, and they'll return my calls and they will, will entertain a discussion. Can I point to a project aside from that ADM project that has an insurance policy like this in place. No, I can't, but it, it could be those are not in the public domain. Um, and, uh, and again, I can't give you the, the name of an insurance company, but, but when I talk to brokers, they will, they will take my calls and express interest. So again, I think, I think there's growing interest and comfort in the insurance markets in, in all of this project types. Are they there yet? No, but they seem to be moving in that direction. Kip, thank you so much. Jamie, we really appreciate your time. Patrick, it's been an awesome conversation with all of you about really complex markets that are changing every day. Thanks for your historical perspective. You've all been in this for about 20 years. And I so appreciate having you on the line with us. And thanks to all the audience members come join us for our next webinar next quarter and um, get signed up so you, you don't miss any or our newsletters. And again, thanks to everybody. You'd hear a big applause if there were actual people that you could see in a real live presentation. And we're getting there soon. Hopefully we'll, we'll be back um, seeing each other in person soon. But again, thanks and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Liz.